this. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet. Apart from your word, we will walk in perfect darkness. As we open your word tonight, we want to declare we have no wisdom above any other person to even interpret your word. May you quicken our minds through your spirit who moved the prophets of old to write these eternal words that we may come to the true knowledge of your will and give us the humility of heart to obey you and your word. We pray by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's coming. Okay. Thank you. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, I think I will be imbalanced, um, standing on one side of the class. Uh, maybe somebody can control this for me, if you don't mind. Yeah? I think it will be easier and make life better. Okay, then I can stand in the middle of the class. I think uh, I'm not doing badly off as a teacher. Uh, the subject today is Babylon the Great is Fallen. And I want to begin by saying that tonight's message is a very solemn message. And I want to say that whatever I will say tonight, I will say with humility of heart. And I pray that as we are going to study this subject, that you may think carefully whether the things we say are so in Scripture and the evidences also that we are going to use, which are extra-biblical uh, references. So I want to say that this message will be a tight one, and I pray that, and I do not see the line, be, be, the line of distinction between exposing error and being judgmental is very thin. And so sometimes while we may talk about some things, it is very likely to mistake that to be judgmental. So let me say as I begin that uh, uh, it is not my intention to be judgmental in any way. I want to speak this message with the humility of heart and I pray that you also take it in the same spirit. Amen. As I mentioned in our first presentation, that the whole of this week we will be studying nothing less but the three angels' messages. And let me say that I do not know any other message apart from the three angels' messages. It is the final warning to the perishing world. And therefore, every presentation that I intend to make, not only in this audience but even elsewhere, I try to look at everything in the big picture of the three angels' messages. And therefore, we have already spent some time at least to look at some few aspects of the first angel's message in the last two presentations. Today, we are going to move to the second angel's message of Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. That will be the key text that we are going to study tonight and try to unlock the mysteries that are coded in that one text, Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. It says there, so you can doing, be doing the writing and the thinking, of course, but I would appreciate if you read with me the text on the screen so that you be sure that uh, we are reading the right thing. Are you with me? And uh, let me say that uh, there are some points that I will be expecting you also to respond because I believe if you are watching a football match, probably you'll be speaking at the top of your voice. So use that voice in the house of God. Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, this is the second angel's message. It says there, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, and the reason is given why it is fallen, it says there, because she has made some nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. At least you are following me. It says there, for she has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of a fornication. So according to this passage, you can notice that there is something the Bible calls Babylon. And Babylon is said to be fallen. It is not on God's side. That is to say, if you belong to Babylon, according to this passage, you do not belong on God's side. Can you see that? 
in that passage babylon is fallen number two babylon is said to be a city it is a great city and the bible says that babylon has a worldwide influence to all the nations of the world and she has made all the nations figuratively speaking drink the wine of the wrath of a fornication so if you can imagine me with me there is this great city babylon she has some wine and this wine she has made all nations drunk and the bible says for this reason babylon is falling is falling the question we want to ask tonight is what is babylon because if babylon is against god you cannot come out of babylon if you do not know what babylon is in the first place and therefore today we want to endeavor to look at what does the bible describe as babylon let us look at the book of revelation john himself will tell us what is babylon Revelation chapter 17 verse 1, he's still reading the writings of John, he's the one who said, fallen is Babylon. So we ask him, what do you mean by Babylon? And he explains in Revelation chapter 17 from verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, say, uh, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show you the judgment of the great who? Whore that sitteth upon many waters. So there is this one angel among seven who comes to speak to John and tells John, Come, I will show you the judgment of a great war or a harlot, if you please. And this harlot, the Bible says, she sits on many waters. With whom the harlot, the kings of the earth, have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication let me ask you is there a, a word that you've read there that is familiar we have read somewhere yes babylon is fallen and the bible says why she has made all the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication but now john sees a hallowed woman who sits upon many waters she has committed wardom or fornication with all the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the earth it says she has made them drunk with the wine of the cup of a fornication let me ask you do you think that probably this woman could be the babylon spoken about let us continue and see whether she is the babylon so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness and i saw a what a woman sit upon a scarlet scarlet is red sitting upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns so he saw this harlot woman sitting upon a beast which is red in color it has seven heads and ten horns upon its head of course you will agree with me that this is symbolic language don't you think so because today there is no in the history of the universe there is no animal with seven heads and ten horns which comes out of the sea are you with me of course he's speaking figuratively so it continues so there is the harlot woman she sits upon a red beast with seven heads and ten horns and she has made all the nations drink the cup of the wrath of her fornication let's continue verse 4 describing the woman it says and the woman was arrayed in purple so she was dressed in purple and scarlet colors that is to say this woman is, uh, is dressed in purple and red these are prominent colors the woman uses and she is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls that is to say she is ornamental and she's uh, this expression also indicates that she could be a very rich and wealthy woman can you notice that yes. and by the way do you notice that this woman is called a harlot and the bible describes the dress code of a harlot you didn't get what i said that she is decked with gold and pearls and precious stones is it possible that those who fornicate with her who cannot afford those things could be using iron sheet and wood and grass <laughs> it says there 
having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of a fornication. So she has a cup there, and in the cup there are the filthiness of a fornication, which are called abominations, and she has made all nations drink from this cup. It continues. But now notice the name of this woman. Now we confirm who is this woman. Verse 5 it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery what? Babylon. So let me ask you, when we are reading in the book of Revelation 14, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Who is Babylon referring to? This is the lady that the Bible calls Babylon. In the book of Revelation 14, the all nations have been made drunk with the white of the, the cup of a fornication. And here we are told that she made all nations drunk with the cup of the wrath of her fornication. So now we confirm that she is Babylon. Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So notice point number two, that this woman is not alone. She is called a mother of harlots. You see, I have met women who have never given birth, but I have never met a mother who has never given birth. Did you get what I said? Yes. That is to say, for her to be called a mother, it means there has to be daughters in this context. She is the mother of harlots. That you notice that the, the mother is a harlot and the daughters and the children are all likewise called harlots. That is to say, the children reflect the image of the mother. Can you see that? And so from this point, we can simply say, like mother, like daughter. So let me ask you, if the mother is decked with gold and precious stones, what do you think the daughters could be doing? <laughs> and I saw the woman, but now notice, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus that is to say this hallowed woman babylon the bible says she is also a persecuting woman she is drunk with the blood of god's people she has shed the blood of the faithful people of god and she is committing fornication with all the kings of the world so question so this is the harlot woman, she's called Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. The cup that she has, has is, uh, the abomination. Let's continue quickly. So now our question, what does this thing mean? Is it a mystery that we cannot understand? Verse 7 clears it up, it says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? Why do you marvel and wonder at these things? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. So let me ask you, is the mystery of the woman hidden or made plain? It says there, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which had the seven heads and the ten horns. That tells you that these things have been opened to us for our study. Let me say that this, the Bible, particularly the book of Revelation, was written in a coded language or in symbolic language because the truths that we are going to reveal touch on prominent people of this world. And if God would have written in plain language, probably we will not be having the Bible today. And so, God preserved the Bible through history by coding the messages of the book of Revelation. Are you getting what I'm saying? And so, the, here we see, the, this is the summary of the vision. There is the harlot woman. Point number one, the harlot was seen to be sitting upon many waters. Again, the harlot was seen to be sitting upon a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. The woman is said to be dressed in purple and scarlet colors. She is decked with gold and precious stones. She is a wealthy woman. She fornicates with all the kings of the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with the wine of this woman. The Bible says that this woman also, uh, apart from that, she has a name on her forehead. She is called Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. That is to say, her name is a mystery. That suggests that probably, the Bible says she is the mother of harlots. She knows she is the mother, but it is probable that the daughters do not know the mother. 
Did you get what I say? The name is a mystery. It is only the mother who knows the children. But the children do not know the mother. The name is a mystery. So it continues. So the question, let's just go back, please. Now, you all agree with me that this is symbolic language. Reason number one, it is impossible to get one woman who fornicates with all the kings of the world. Is that true? Number two, it is impossible to find a literal woman sitting on a seven-headed beast. And she's also sitting upon many waters. So you do not need a PhD in theology to know that this is symbolic language. Are you with me? So now, if this is symbolic language, the questions will be, what does a woman represent? What does the beast represent? And what do the waters represent? And then we will look at the other aspects of this woman. But those are the three important uh, questions that we want to start with. So what does a woman represent? In the book of Revelation, there are only two women. The first woman we find in Revelation chapter 12, and the other woman is the one we are reading about. And the Bible describing the other woman, it says in Revelation chapter 19 verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Question, who is represented by the Lamb? John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of what? the world. The Lamb is an expression of Jesus Christ. So according to this passage, we are to give honor to him for the marriage of Jesus is come. Question, will Jesus ever marry? According to this passage, yes. And Jesus, who instituted the marriage in, uh, in the Garden of Eden, must be also in a monogamous relationship with one woman. <laughs> Did you catch what I said? Yes. Jesus is not polygamous. It says, and his wives. No, it says his wife. wife. He has one wife. So, marriage according to God is between one man and another man. One man and at least two women. No, it's one man, one wife. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Do you notice that the wife of Jesus does not clothe herself. She is clothed. And you'll notice that the cloth represents something. It says there, she is arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen represents the what of the saints? The righteousness of the same. So let me ask you, according to this passage, what do you think the woman, the bride of the Lamb represents? It represents the saints of God, the people of God, the church of God, if you please. So you can notice, by the way, is there a contrast between the way this lady is dressed and the other woman? So should there be a distinction between how the ladies who associate with this woman dress and the ladies who associate with the other woman dress? Should there be a difference? Yes. Of course there should be. So it says there, so you can notice that a woman in the book of Revelation represents the church, God's people in this case. So it continues. We can notice also a, a parallel text, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, talking about this woman, the church of God. It says, and, the woman were, uh, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for how long? For a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So according to this passage, it says the woman fled to the wilderness for a time, times 
and half a time or dividing of time. Now the question is, notice Daniel, the book of Daniel also borrows this expression and tells us who fled into the wilderness. Here we are told that it is the woman, but notice Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, it says there, and he, this little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out or persecute the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and laws. And they, the saints, shall be given unto his hand until a time, times and the dividing of time. So let me ask you, according to the book of Revelation, who was to flee during the time of persecution? The woman did, for a time, times and dividing of time. But here we are being told, there was this little horn that was persecuting the saints of the Most High for a time, times and half a time. In another language, if you put Revelation and Daniel together, it will tell you the woman represents the saints. Can you see that? That is to say, the woman, or a woman in scripture, represents the church. Okay, so what does that mean? In fact, God's Old Testament church, which is the nation of Israel, notice how God spoke about Israel while they were faithful to God. It says there, Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a calm and delicate what? Woman. So notice when God was talking about his church in the Old Testament, which was the nation of Israel, while they were faithful to God, God said, I liken you to a comely and delicate woman. That is to say, God's faithful church is likened with a chest with a virgin woman. But I want you to notice that in the book of Revelation chapter 17, John was, uh, saw another woman who is a harlot woman. Now the question is, if a virtuous woman represents God's church, what does a harlot woman represent? Let's continue about this. Notice when Israel were unfaithful to God, notice how God spoke about Israel. While they were faithful, he said, I have likened you to a comely and delicate woman. But notice when Israel were in apostasy and worshipping idols, notice what God said. It says there, Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 1, they say, for example, if a man put away his wife, if, for example, I put away my wife, and she go from him and become another man, so she leaves me and she, went and she goes and becomes another man's wife, shall he return to her again? Will I go to the same woman again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? God is saying. But there Israel has played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, says the Lord. So notice when Israel were following other gods and idols and were not faithful to God, God said Israel has played the role of a what? A hallowed. That is to say, in scripture, a hallowed woman represents an unfaithful church or a religious body. While a faithful church is likened to a virgin, virtuous woman. Are you getting what I'm saying? So in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, Babylon, the great city, the hallowed woman represents a particular religious movement or church on earth that claims to be the husband of God, but it is unfaithful to God. That is why it's likened to a hallowed woman. Are you getting what I'm saying? So let's continue. So in the book of Revelation, there are only two women that tells you in the whole of the universe, earth, there are only two churches. There is the true church, the virtuous woman, who is the wife of the Lamb, and you notice she's only one, which will suggest or indicate God's true church is only one on earth. And number two, there is the other church represented by the harlot woman and notice that the harlot woman is not alone, she has daughters. That is to say, there are other churches which came from the mother. Are you getting it? So we have the true church of God, one woman, one true church, and we have the harlot woman, the unfaithful church, and from her, other churches were born. She is the mother, if you remember the expression. Are you with me? So let's continue.
Now, the, somebody will ask, the harlot woman was sitting upon many waters. Now, the question is, what do the waters represent if the harlot represents the church? It says there, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, talking about the waters, it says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sowest, where the woman, the wall seated, are computers. <laughs> is that what it says? No. What do the waters represent? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That is to say, the waters are a symbol of peoples and multitudes and nations. That is to say, this woman is a worldwide woman. This church, sitting on meeting waters, the woman is the church, the waters are the nations and peoples. That tells you that church is a worldwide church. It is everywhere on this earth and many people, multitudes and nations are following the woman. Are you getting the, the, what John is saying here? It continues. So now somebody will ask, okay, now we know the harlot woman is an apostate church. The waters represent the multitude, nation, tongues, and people. But the harlot woman was also sitting on a beast. Now the question is, how can a church sit upon a beast? What does a beast represent? Notice again, the book of Daniel and Revelation actually are a lock and key. Notice God also spoke to Daniel using the same language of beasts. And it says there, Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great beasts came out of the sea, diverse one from another. And those are the four beasts. The first one was like a lion. You can read the whole chapter. The second one was like a bear. The third like a leopard. And the fourth one was like a dragon-like beast. Now the question is, when God was talking to Daniel through this beast vision, the question is, what does a beast represent? Verse 17, it says there. Let's continue. This great beast which are four, are four what? Kings which shall arise out of the earth. So you notice that God uses beasts to represent what? Kings. Verse 23, it says also, it amplifies the same expression. It says, thus he said, the angel, the fourth beast that you can see on the screen shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. That is to say, a beast is a symbol of a king or a kingdom. Because you cannot have a king without a kingdom. So a beast is a symbol of a kingdom or a nation, if you please. So, back to the book of Revelation. What do we see here? We see a harlot woman who is sitting upon a scarlet beast. And she's also sitting upon many waters. The harlot woman represents an apostate church, religious system. The beast represents a kingdom or a nation. And the waters represents multitudes, peoples, tongues, and nation. So what does that mean? It simply means what John saw in the book of Revelation, he saw a particular religious system, the harlot woman, a church. That church is a worldwide church. She's sitting upon many waters. And you can notice that the woman is riding a beast. That tells you that there is a particular nation on earth, a kingdom, a beast, and that nation is riding a church, or you have a combination of a church and a state or a nation. A nation is a beast, a woman is a church. So you have a nation united with a church, and that church is a worldwide church, and from that church, other churches came from it. The daughters. Are you getting it? So start thinking. Start thinking. Now the question is, which church is represented in the book of Revelation? Of course, I will not tell you which church. We will let the Bible to tell you which church. Revelation chapter 17, the first question is, let us look at this kingdom, this beast, this nation. Notice what the Bible says about the nation. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. So what is a, uh, the characteristic of this beast? The Bible says, this nation has names of blasphemy. Now, the question is, what does the Bible mean by the expression blasphemy? What is 
blasphemy. If we know what is blasphemy, we can trace which nation is this one. Obviously, this nation cannot be uh, Djibouti because uh, Djibouti does not run any church that is worldwide. Are you getting me? Yes. So the question is, which uh, nation is this? Let us define blasphemy. Notice John chapter 10 verse 30. Jesus said, I and my father are one. Wow. By the way, you see, sometimes I hear people arguing about uh, the Trinity. And people say, Christians, you have three gods. Uh, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now that is a very weak argument. Let me ask you, when two people get married, what does the Bible say? They are? In fact, Matthew chapter 19 says, they are no longer twain or two, but they are one. So let me ask you, if two can be one, what is the problem with three being one? So they are three. So let me ask you, when two people are married, when you look at them, you see one person, isn't it? No. You look at them, you see how many people? Two. But the Bible says they are not two. They are. So let me ask you. The Father and Jesus are one person, isn't it? No. They are two distinct persons. But they are one. They are not two. He says, I and my Father are one. Are you with me? That is to say, Jesus said, I am God. When he said that, notice what happened. Then the Jews took up stones against to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? It continues to say, My friend, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. That is the word. Now, what is blasphemy? It says, And because thou being a man makest thyself God. You see, the Jews were looking at Jesus with human eyes. This is the son of Mary, the son of the carpenter. And now he's saying that he's God. That is blasphemy. So let me ask you, according to scripture, what is the definition of blasphemy? It is when a mere man claims to be God. Are you getting that? Now, the beast has blasphemous names. That tells you in that nation, in that kingdom, there will be mere men who will claim to be God. Are you getting it? That is the definition of blasphemy. The second definition of blasphemy... Luke chapter 5, verse 20, you know, you know that story? When the hall was packed and they brought a sick man through the roof, you remember that? Then Jesus looking at the sick person, he said the following, And when he, said, and when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So Jesus, being God, forgive, forgave the person his sins. But now notice, Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this? Which speaketh what? Blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, Jesus did not blaspheme because he is God. And he has the power to forgive sin. But if a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sin, the Bible calls that blasphemy. So let me ask you. If you wrong me and I forgive you, is that blasphemy? <laughs> No, it is not blasphemy. But let me ask you, what if your friend steals your pen, then the thief comes to repent to me, and I forgive him? What does that become? Blasphemy. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, we cannot remit people's sin, but we can forgive if somebody wrongs you. Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. So, blasphemy is, when Jesus forgives that person, they say, that is blasphemy. So, that means, that beast 
That nation has blasphemous names. It means in that kingdom, in that nation, there will be mere men who will claim to be God. And number two, they will claim they have the power to forgive sin. Are you with me? More characteristics about this woman we see that she was sitting upon many waters. And we have seen that the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. That means she must be a worldwide religious system. I think it is obvious this woman, let's just continue. This woman cannot, go back, go back. The next slide. Okay, there. Of course, this woman cannot be representing Legio Maria. Because Legio Maria is not a worldwide religious movement. If you go to Portugal, you will not find Legio Maria. Are you getting it? Yes, this woman is sitting upon multitudes, many waters. She is a worldwide, renowned religious system. Number two, another characteristic she, about this woman, it says, she has committed fornication with the what? The kings of the earth. That is to say, this, uh, this woman, she has relations with all nations. In fact, do you notice that she is a church, a woman, and a beast, a nation? That means if it is a nation like Kenya or any other nation, it is a nation, it must be having armies and ambassadors even to other nations. She has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. And you see, it is called fornication with the kings because it is unlawful relation. You see, Jesus separated church and state. He said, give unto God which belongs to God and... Caesar, what belongs to? That is to say, Jesus separated politics from religion. Let me ask you. Is there money that belongs to God? When you work and at the end of the month, you get some pay for your work. Is there a portion of that money that belongs to God? Yes. What do you call it? Yes. Type. Let me ask you. From the same money, is there money that belongs to Caesar? What do you call it? Yes. By the way, should you be paying taxes? Yes. yes. But you do not pay taxes with your tithe. <laughs> Are you getting the distinction? But when you combine church and state, that is fornication and lawful. Are you getting it? Point number four, notice another characteristic of this woman. The Bible says she was clothed in purple and scarlet. That is to say, this religious system, this church, can be readily identified by the use of purple and red garments. She was dressed in purple and red. Are you getting it? She is decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. That tells you it must be a wealthy and rich religious system. In fact, when you go into her religious services, probably you will find some of the precious stones everywhere. Are you starting to think with me? The Bible says about this woman that I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That is to say, in the history of this woman in this church, she has persecuted God's people. At some point, she has shed the blood of God's people. Are you getting it? So let us put the summary of this. Let's continue, jump there. So what, which church is represented here? Number one, she must be a worldwide church, she is sitting on many waters. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 and 15. Number two, she is a church and a state. A woman and a beast. A woman is the church, the beast is a kingdom or a nation. Number two, the state speaks blasphemy. She had names of blasphemy. And blasphemy means they will claim to be God or to have the power to forgive sin. Number three, that church has relations with the kings of the earth because she is a nation and a church at the same time. Number five, that church is well known for the use of red and purple garments. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. That church must be a wealthy and a rich religious system. She was decked with gold and pearls and precious stones. Point number seven. 
That church has persecuted God's people. She was drunk with the blood of the saints. So let me ask you. Is there any religious system on earth that has all of these Bible characteristics? Did you get my question? Is there any religious system on earth that has all of these identifying characteristics? By the way, let me add point number eight. This woman is called mother of harlots. That is to say, there are other churches, the daughters, that came out of her. So do we have a church today that is a worldwide church? It is a church and a nation at the same time. It speaks blasphemies. It has relations with all the kings of the earth. It is well known for the use of red and purple garments. It is a wealthy church. It has persecuted God's people in its history. And out of her, other churches came from. Let me tell you, there is only one religious system on the universe that has all of these characteristics. And that is it. The Vatican. Now let me ask you, Vatican City is a nation like any other, true or false, with armies and ambassadors. It is an independent nation. It is a beast, a kingdom like Kenya or the United States or any other. It is a nation. And it also runs a religious movement. It is a nation and a church at the same time. What is the name of this church? The papacy, it is called. Just go back. So let me ask you, is that religious system a worldwide religious system? Yes. In fact, the word Catholic itself means universal. She was sitting on many waters. Now let us continue and see whether all the other characteristics are in there. Let's continue. That is the, the, the previous president. Now the Bible says that she, he speaks blasphemies. Question. Has the papacy ever spoken blasphemy? Now, on this point, I want to quote from authentic church sources. You did not write this. I did not write this. It is the papacy who wrote this from official Catholic documents. Listen to what they say. This document says, All names which in the scriptures are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. You didn't get that. They say, all the names in scripture that are applied to Christ because Christ is the head of the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope because the Pope is the visible head of the church. That is to say, if Jesus is the bread of life, the Pope is the bread of life. If Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Pope becomes the lion of the tribe of Judah. If Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, the Pope becomes Emmanuel, God with us. The Lamb of God. And all names in scriptures that are applied to Christ, they say that all those names are applied to the Pope. Let's continue. Listen to another statement. By the way, what is the name of God? Notice when Jesus was praying, he said the following word, John 17, 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these, my disciples, are in the world. And I come to thee, who? Holy Father, keep them through thy own, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So let me ask you, how did Jesus refer to God? Holy Father. And they said, all the names that are applied to God and Jesus Christ 
are applied to the Pope. So question, will you expect them to refer to the Pope as Holy Father? Let us see. Let's continue. We have another Holy Father on earth. Blasphemy, if you please. Notice what Pope Leo XIII, he wrote this in 1894. He said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. So did they speak blasphemy? Yes, it continues. Notice what Pope Pius V said, the Pope and God are the same. So he has all power in heaven and earth. Wow, did you know that God lives in Vatican? The Pope said, Pope Pius V, God and the Pope are the same. Now, if that is not blasphemy, I do not know what is blasphemy. I cannot speak such words. Let's continue. Pope John II, before he died, he said in 1984, Don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. <laughs> now, that is a statement. The Catholic Encyclopedia, talking about the roles of the priest, it says this, this judicial authority of the priest or the father will even include the power to forgive sins. Is that blasphemy? When a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sin. Yes, it is according to scripture. And that is why they claim that the father and the pope they have the power to forgive sin. Let's continue. Notice again this uh, Roman Catholic document. It says, the priest does not have to ask God to forgive your sins. The priest himself has the power to do so in Christ's name. Your sins are forgiven by the priest the same as if you knelt before Jesus Christ. Wow. That is a statement and a half. Let's continue. And that is why they have that kind of a system in the church. Of course, that is me over there uh, trying to look out for this information. So the priest, go back. <laughs> so the priest goes in there and sits in there as God. And then you go in the other side. And through those holes, you confess your sins, and as God, he forgives you. That is the system. The Bible says he had names of blasphemy. The Bible says she was dressed in purple and scarlet. There it is. By the way, do you notice that the Bible says she was decked in gold and pearls? and precious stones. It is a wealthy, rich, religious system. By the way, did the Bible say that she has for committed fornication with all the kings of the earth? She has ambassadors to all nations. She is, in fact, she sits as an observer in the United Nations. Let's continue. Has the Roman church ever persecuted God's people? Yes. Of course, if you read church history, that is why we have something today we call the Reformation. And the, in fact, today we have Christians called Protestants. A name that comes out of the persecution of God's people who were faithful. And today, the world has forgotten people like Martin Luther. John Calvin, John Haas, and all these faithful men who died under the power of Rome. Today, people have forgotten that history. She was drunk with the blood of the saints, the Bible said. Let's continue. Of course, she ruled for over 120 
for, for about 12, 60 years, for a time, times and half a time. I do not want to read this because of time. Uh, just to jump that one. Now the question is, why is the papacy likened unto a harlot? Already we have seen that Israel, while they were unfaithful to the voice of God, God said that you have played an harlot. That tells you, if the papacy is likened unto a harlot, it means she must not be following the voice of God, like ancient Israel. Are you getting what I'm saying? That means she is not faithful to the word of God. Notice, who is the husband of the church? Who is the husband of the church? Jesus is. But now notice how Jesus describes himself. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the husband of the church is Jesus Christ, who is God, and he says, I am the word. The word is a reflection of who Jesus is. That is to say, if you play a harlot to Jesus, it means you must not be faithful to the word which is a reflection of who he is. Are you getting what I'm saying? But the question is, is the Roman Catholic papacy... Now let me make this statement. When I talk about the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church, I am not talking about Roman Catholics. I am talking about the system and not the people in the system. Are you with me? I want to say they are faithful God's people in all religions. Are you with me? But they are religions that do not belong to God. I hope you get the difference. Are you getting what I'm saying? So I'm not talking about individual people. I'm talking about the system. Because even some of us who are born and found the system there. So it is not about individuals. It is about systems. It says there, the word of God says, Exodus chapter 20 verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Let me ask you, what is in heaven above? Jesus is in heaven. Angels are in heaven. The Bible says the stars and the sun are in heaven. And all this, all that which is in the earth beneath, animals, serpents, all that which is in the water under the earth, Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, or serve them. For the Lord thy God, I am a jealous God. That is a very clear commandment of God. But the papacy, let me say this, if anybody here would want to check me out, whether whatever I'm saying is true, just go and find your catechism that you bought with your own money, and go for the page that has the Ten Commandments, and look for this commandment. It's missing. Go and do that tonight. So, that's the commandment of God that says, Thou shalt not make thyself graven images. But when they deleted that commandment and made all these graven images, God said, The church has played and hallowed. Let's continue. Apart from the second commandment, the fourth commandment of God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor, and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the seventh day Adventists. No, let me repeat it. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. What does it say? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy main man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gate. And the reason is given why? For in six days, likewise, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, when it comes to that commandment, it's where a problem begins. Because number one, there are people who will tell you, the Sabbath belongs to the Jews. Of course, we have already said that God said, the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So that argument does not hold. Number two, the Sabbath came into existence in the first week of creation. And there were only two people, Adam and Eve, who were not Jews. 
Are you with me? Yes. Uh, by the way, let me make this statement. There are two things that God made holy in the Garden of Eden before the existence of a Jew. Of a Jew. Number one, the Sabbath. And number two, marriage. And let me put it this way. If the Sabbath is for the Jews, marriage also should be for the Jews. And everybody who is not a Jew should forsake his marriage. But if you agree that marriage is for all people, it must also mean Sabbath is for all people. Because they all began at the same time with the same author. Are you with me? But the question is, which is the Sabbath day? Of course, the other argument, they will say, that when Jesus died, the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. We are under the grace, we are not under the law. So let me ask you, if the Sabbath was nailed on the cross, and they say the law was nailed to the cross, so we should now steal and rape. The law was nailed to the cross, isn't it? No. So if stealing remains wrong, what we are meaning is, when Jesus died, he died with the Ten Commandments and resurrected with nine. And left one in the grave. So question, when is the Sabbath day? Of course there are those who will tell you that the Sabbath day is Friday. There are those who will say the Sabbath day is Saturday. There are those who will say the Sabbath day is Sunday. There are those who will say the Sabbath day is any day. It depends from where you start counting. <laughs> but the problem is those who say you can count from anywhere, they never start counting from Monday and they go to church on Tuesday. I've never met such Christians. Nobody goes to church on Monday. Monday everybody goes to work. So the question is, when is the Sabbath day? Just go back. So when is the Sabbath day? Point number one, I want you to notice that all days cannot be Sabbath days. Why? Reason number one is because if you say all days can be Sabbath days, it means God created in all days. But Genesis says he did not create in all days. There is a day that he was working and there is a day that he was resting. So that argument does not hold. Are you getting what I'm saying? So there is a time that he rested. And if you say the Sabbath is any day, it means also God blessed any day. The Bible says he did not bless any day. It says he blessed the seventh day. And there is a difference. So the question is, which day is this? Of course... Uh, if you study the book, of, uh, the, the book of Luke chapter 23 about the death of Jesus, uh, it will tell you that Jesus died on the preparation day, verse 54, and the next day is called the Sabbath day. So if you know the day that Jesus died, the next day is called the Sabbath day. The day that Jesus resurrected in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, it is called the first day of the week. So if you know... The first day of the week, if you can get the day that Jesus died, you can know the first day of the week and you start counting from there. And it is a historical fact, it is not disputed historically, that Jesus died and the day that he died is accepted historically that he died on Friday. So the Sabbath day becomes, oh, where is my bag? Quickly before it goes off. We have about 6% there. Quickly, quickly. My friend, you can be quicker than that. <laughs> yes, while somebody connects that, you can continue with the slide. But where did Sunday come from? That is the question. You've connected? Okay, let's continue. Where did Sunday come from? Let's quote from authentic chat sources. Okay. This is a Catholic document. Notice what it says. Sunday is our mark of authority. 
The church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath of servants is a proof of that fact. So the Catholics say, our church is above the Bible. And if you want to know we are above the Bible, we can transfer the Sabbath from the seventh day to Sunday. Straight talk. Notice another Catholic document. They say, those who follow the Bible as their guide, the Israelites and the Seventh-day Adventists have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side, while the biblical protestant, the other protestants, has not a word in self-defense for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Wow. <laughs> so Rome says, Catholic says, in her own books, that the only people who follow the Bible as their guide are the Israelites and Seventh-day Adventists, because the Bible says, remember the Sabbath. While the other protestant, while he's carrying the Bible, Catholics say they do not have even one word for substituting Saturday for Sunday. That is straight talk. But I want you to notice that Rome is not alone. She was called the mother of That is to say, from her, other churches came from. But now the question is, you see, you may not belong to Rome, but you may belong to the daughter. And you may not know you belong to the daughter because the name is a mystery. The children do not know the mother. But the mother knows the children. So the question is, how will you know the daughters? Very simple. Let's go quickly. We want to wind up. You see, there are many churches today in the world and somebody will be asking, and somebody asked the question, how will you know which church is true? We will look at that, the other woman we will look at her, but today we want to look at the other hallowed woman and her daughters. And it is estimated that by the year 2025, denominations will increase to up to 55,000. Now that is a serious problem. And all these denominations claim to be the gateway taking people to heaven. So let us see. How will you know whether the church you attend is a daughter of Rome? The Bible gives a very simple text. It says, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 44, Behold, everyone that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her. In another language, like mother, like so if you want to know any religious movement on earth that is classified as the daughter of Rome, all you need to do is look at the mother. And the daughter will reflect the image of the mother. So quickly, how does the mother look like? Number one, we have seen the mother has idols of Mary, apostles, crosses, and, and Christ, all those things. So if you see any religious system that people walk with long crosses of Jesus and these idols of these and the rosary and those things, you know that that is a daughter of Rome. Like mother, like daughter. So don't ask me where is Legion Maria in the Bible. Don't ask me that. Number two, the mother admits that the Sabbath is Saturday but worships on Sunday. So if you see any religious movement or church or denomination, so to speak, that will admit that the Sabbath is Saturday, but worships on Sunday, like mother, like daughter. Listen to what the daughters say. This is a video clip. I want you to play this and listen carefully. Go back. <laughs> 